we have uh, from Jess seven generations enough for all forever uh, endurance resilience we have a kind of recognition of environment people and economy uh, really a scale that looks at what we do on a daily basis through our culture driving our thoughts driving our behavior affects the earth the nation, the region, the city, the neighborhood. And all of those scales are in play in different stages. Um, we got to kind of look at how UB tries to translate that scaling dimension in its own activities. And I think overall got to the point about it's not about, it, it is about more, not less. Uh, from Bart, it's the overview, right? We, we know where we are. We kind of get an idea collectively of where we might go, but one size doesn't fit all. Through one region forward, we get to uh, grow where we've already grown. Think land use. We build and protect walkable communities. Think housing and neighborhoods. We better connect our transportation options. Think about the range of options and through connections and access the text on transportation. And we think about farmland, parks, natural areas, and food systems in one form or another. All of that done well addresses climate change. And all of that with climate change establishes municipal fiscal strength. That is to say, this is not about spending more here, here, and here. It's about spending smarter and achieving better municipal capacity in our growth. When we started One Region Forward, there was an imagination we were going to take the Erie Niagara County planning framework and give it some teeth. Right? Make it able to drive decision making across the region. And the first few public meetings we had, we got our head handed to us. <laughs> Get out of my neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll figure it out. Um, we live here now. There's a reason there's home rule. And so we started to evolve with the communities we worked with. An approach that says, by all means, there's laws that govern us in a broad scale. Counties and authorities have certain kinds of powers and authorities. But so does the Buffalo Niagara Riverkeeper. That group, thank you for joining us, Lori. That group comes to us as a group who 20 years ago, 30 years ago, friends of the Buffalo River, kind of whiny group, right? Don't do that to the river. I can speak this way because my wife was part of that founding group. <laughs> and, and over time, it's now a $3 million a year operation. Four. And it, four, thank you. <laughs> it's been a good year. <laughs> and they run multi million dollar things like the Buffalo River Remedial Action Plan and the Niagara River Remedial Action Plan is coming right behind it. A whole way of thinking and working in our region with real capacity, power, and authority vested in them. We did the same thing with a number of not-for-profit groups. And local advocates working through all manner of devices like David Holm Baker's work take us to new places and capacity. But these authorities are distributed. They're not centralized. And thank God. <laughs> so imagine now the challenge is thanking God for that, or someone for that, we also have that ability to work across them. And it's figuring out how to work across them that's key. That's why we bring planners like Nick Rakovich to the deal. He's a planner and an architect. So am I, so I like him a lot. <laughs> but, but overall, that's that notion of thinking about what you build before you build, recognizing that architecture without planning can be kind of silly sometimes, and planning without architecture can be soulless. Well, Nick wraps it up and delivers both at once. And that's part of the way we think about the world. So we've got an interesting panel with the Riverkeeper, with, with Nick joining us, with uh, David Hahn Baker as a consultant and an advocate, and, and, and in every significant consortium of people interested in the environment, we find David. <laughs> so they're here, you're there, 
questions or observations about what you've just heard, I'll look for hands and find you with a mic, share it with the group and with this team, um, not speeches, the most important thing that comes to mind would be helpful, not everything that comes to mind. And then we will see if we can unpack some of it with the panelists and I'll direct it to the, uh, to the group we have. So who wants in first? All the way in the back. He's coming to you with a mic. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Rath. I'm a member of the Sierra Club, so I know your wife well. Excellent. Uh, Probably better than me now. <laughs> no, not, not that well. <clears throat> I'm, I'm recently relocated from uh, Dallas, about a, about a year, a little less than a year. And I really appreciate the chance to come here. One of the things that I think is uh, intertwined with what everyone says is markets, businesses. So you have the business group. But the reason people move out into the country is, I'm guessing, mostly economics and market. And the reason builders build homes in the country is because there's a market for it and they can make money for it. The reason people drive cars is probably due to economics and markets and those kind of things. So uh, if we're going to make these changes, how do you affect the markets? Is there a strategy to affect the markets? Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a great question. I'm not sure we got an answer, but I'm going to give it to Bart to first. We've got to have a mic down here, too. You're going to have to bring a mic back down here. These guys are going to need it, too. So you, this guy's going to lose 10 pounds in the next two years. You know, I'm actually going to defer to David uh, <laughs> while I think about this one. Uh, thank you. Um, not that I have an answer uh, to these questions. Um, I mean, maybe one way to the provider, I was thinking about what I should say and where we should go in this. And I start out with, you know, one region for it. And for each of these things, I had questions about them. Uh, one uh, went back to an old story where the Lone Ranger and Tonto are uh, fighting some range war, doing something, and they're surrounded by a bunch of Indians and about to be killed. And the Lone Ranger turns to Tonto and says, Tonto, I think we've had it. And Tonto replied, what do you mean we, white man? Uh, <laughs> uh, and that one, you know, how, what does one mean? Are we one family, one person, one group? And, and things change in this society so much and so quickly. Uh, definitions change. Um, that was sort of the first question I had, what do we mean one? And one region for it. Um, what is the region uh, that we're talking about? And that's an economic question, too. Uh, what market are we talking about? Are we talking about uh, the U.S. market? Are we talking about the world market? Are we talking about an individual? Are we t how much is enough? And those types of questions, too. So again, it gets me back to the question of what region are we talking about here? And forward, what is forward? Um, um, are people wanting to, we don't want to change. We like things the way they are. The world is changing um, all the time. And so what is forward? Uh, what is progress in these things? So it all gets back to me to questions um, that unfortunately we need to answer before we move forward. And even the qu question at hand about economics is, again, it just gets back to it's hard for me to come with an answer to your question um, without really thinking about a bunch of substrates and markets and things like that that I don't know if we're there yet. But Hopefully, by having more talk and more conversation, we can get to those answers. So David consults with businesses, and he brings us the most academic possible construction of the question, which is, what do we mean by one? What do we mean by region? What do we mean by forward? The direct answer to the question from one region forward is, it isn't an economic development plan. It's a land use, transportation, it's a way to think about land use, transportation, climate change, food systems, um, housing, neighborhoods. Why did we get away with not doing an economic development plan? Because we got one. It's called the Prosperity Plan. It's delivered through a different definition of region, five counties, not two. And it's, it's derived from the governor's approach to creating the same response to the state as we are to the 64 municipalities in our two-county region. Two counties because 
God, we're going to do it for five? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's arbitrary, but on the other hand, we had a history in, in the Erie Niagara County planning framework of starting this conversation, maybe missing the mark by a certain assumption about having to rely solely on county powers and authorities, and pulling back, relying on a much wider network of power and authority. The economics of the prosperity plan are driven by a whole host of collaborative constructions that take us to the direction we want to go in, what market sectors and what things enable those market sectors to deliver smart growth, one of the key principles in the prosperity plan. Point two, the Buffalo Billion is a version of that, moving from eight economic sectors to three, still with, in the city of Buffalo, a primary focus on smart growth, which deals with the density, transportation, walkable communities themes that deliver a good response to climate change and better municipal economies. So we think all of that shapes the way we think about market. And it's connected. They're all part, we're back office for all of that, we at the regional institute. So we're able to put the same set of metrics across those specters and literally hold up the mirror. Market, what do you think? And with what consequence to you do you make this decision or that decision? And what performance to the region? Yes, sir. What three other counties are included in this? The five county uh, regional economic development plan is Cattaraugus, Chautauqua, and Allegheny, along with uh, Erie and Niagara. Over here on this side. <laughs> you get to trade off halfway through this. Um, I grew up on Long Island and lived in Manhattan for years. Coming up here, first Welcome. of all, <laughs> well, um, my comment is about transportation. And it seems like a lot of the issues we face, whether it's urban sprawl and whether it's the uh, belief that, you know, uh, you need the economics to own a car to get to your job. You, don't, you can't get as good of a job if you don't get there, if you can't get there. I have been floored for 30 years as to why we have no transportation system. So it would seem to me, especially coming from an, an enormous transportation system in Manhattan, from subway to buses that are very efficient, especially nowadays, very sa much safer, clean, the whole bit. They've grown tremendously, but it accounts, it allows for some of the issues to be dealt with, such as if you don't own a car or you can't afford to own a car, it's much cheaper for public transportation. We had a subway system going from downtown Buffalo to South Campus, which I laughed when I saw that. We have no rush hour because we don't have enough people for, you know, I mean, we have, we have, we have the ability, I would think, to solve a lot of our issues if we created an infrastructure of transportation. Why has that not been a priority over all of these? And I said, I've been here for 30 years. I'm waiting. So I just pose that as to why that doesn't solve so many of our issues. Right here. She's going to answer this question. Uh, Elizabeth Giles, Citizens for Regional Transit. Um, I'm sorry to say, I understand your perspective, but um, our, gr our goal as a public transit um, advocacy group is to try and overcome a negative image of public transportation in Western New York. It's basically, it has a stigma. Um, as you can see on those slides, mostly the poor take it. It's considered to be mode of the desperate as opposed to a valuable green amenity for us all. Please see me later. I'll give you my card. You can get on board with us advocating for transit expansion. Uh, by the way, the original metro rail system was planned to be 46 miles long. It was not supposed to go underground on Main Street, and it's going underground that chewed through the whole budget. But originally, we were supposed to have uh, light rail to the airport, to UB North, um, to Orchard Park, to Hamburg, Tonawanda. It was really quite an extensive system. And we could get there. We still have the publicly owned rights of way sitting there, waiting for rail line to be laid. But it's a question of the money, the public will to find um, a sustainable um, you know, funding for, for operations and maintenance after it's built. If we stay on top of this, what we do with Citizen Planning School is those kinds of exchanges, and I hope in more depth as we find opportunities, and also create the capacity to advocate. So the Citizens for Regions Transit, a stalwart advocacy group. There's several other people in the room that are part of various advocacy efforts. 
our hope is to not give, but establish the conditions for citizens to take voice in the political decisions that are going to be made. There is an alignment study in place right now that would at least take the extension out to the North Campus in Amherst as one of the major centers. The short answer to the question, why haven't we done it already? Because of the way we've been building. We're scattering across the landscape in ways that aren't concentrated enough to make public transit pay for itself. <laughs> and only with the density will we get the land uses necessary for that. So we've got some serious work to do. Other questions? Right here, young woman. I'm just wondering, um, for um, in Amherst, I live in East Amherst, and the growth is crazy out there. The Geico complex, complex and Cross Point, and now um, out transit, there's tons of more building. They're knocking down lots of trees and lots of green areas. And when I wrote to one of the um, people on the Amherst Town Board, he said, what properties exactly are you talking about? I'm like, man, how am I going to tell him, like, the, the 20 different properties that I see? And my question is, is like what you were saying, Bart, do you, do you go to the Amherst Town Board, or are there people, you know, is there, is there, it doesn't look like to me like there's any planning or programming done for that area, so I'm just wondering. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is, I'm going to steal a line from David. It's the University of Buffalo's fault. If, if we hadn't gone out to Amherst, we wouldn't have created the tendency to build around it in that sort of sprawling dynamic. So over to you, Jessica. Uh, Fix this. I, to be honest, I don't have any specific answer to that question. <laughs> Um, but I would have to agree with, with Dean Shibley about um, it's a constant struggle, our three campuses. I think we've been doing a better job of being downtown, if I could just address that that point. Um, but yeah, I, I think through the One Region Forward plan, there's been efforts to, to try to coordinate more with the different townships. Is that true? I'm going to ask Bart to respond, but I'll also say that the metrics that are coming out of one region forward, one set of metrics, anybody can use them any way they want to. You can say, here's what it's going to cost you as a municipal government if you keep building in this pattern. And there's a toolkit that will tell you how to get to that number. And Amherst won't be able to afford to sustain that kind of build out with the kind of numbers that Bart was sharing just in road systems alone. And the developer says these wonderful things. They say things like, I'm going to give you the road system. It's a gift. Yeah. And 30 years later, you'll still be paying for that gift with tax revenues you're not earning. <laughs> and so at some level, it's a self-defeating strategy. And we see in the inner ring neighborhoods and inclu in communities, including Amherst, an increase in poverty there. So you're beginning to see the same thing that happened to the city in that first round of investment sprawling out to the inner ring neighborhoods, and it'll continue. Bart? <clears throat> yeah, I'll just, you know, I'll actually defer it to, to this afternoon. We'll have a, a speaker who will talk a little bit more on um, the interactions that, uh, like the, some of the nuts and bolts about interacting with local government as it relates to planning issues. Uh, there's uh, also, we're going to have Nadine Marrero, who, uh, works uh, a lot with the city of Buffalo on their planning board, and she would be a great person to talk to, uh, both in terms of question and answer, but afterwards about you know exactly how do you navigate those waters um, within the town of Amherst. I, we're going to hold. Come back on the network. Go. I want to ask a question about density and how density um, impacts development and how we can change, someone talked about how do we change our value around transportation and the fact that people see transportation as something unfavorable. Well, I'm a New Yorker, uh, grew up in Manhattan, and I think that there's also a negative perception of density. Everybody wants a house with a lot of yard and all of these things, and what I've seen in the city and it was interesting, they talked about urban scale and density and getting back to density. 
And I live in a neighborhood that's right downtown that was built as a suburban kind of neighborhood. So how do you get density back in areas where we're building houses that look like suburban houses? Um, I think anybody want to take that? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to hold that for the afternoon. We're going to get have, have an opportunity to ask a, a core question. Go ahead. It would well, be nice if, if people, to spark their imagination, had a model location to look at and see these ideas embodied. And, and would it be possible for the North Campus to be turned into a model of what you want? I, I think it's kind of low density now, superhighway inundated. So if that could be, that seems like that's an area you have the most leverage over. Mm -hmm. There is, a, a, he'll take it. There, there is a, a comprehensive plan for the North Campus, um, uh, as well as the South Campus and downtown for the University at Buffalo. It assumes a number of things, not the least of which, for the first time in UB's planning history, it married up with the surrounding communities and said, you got a plan, we got a plan, let's, let's actually make those borders work. That's a smaller scale version of what Bart and his team and our team has done at the Regional Institute. We started our effort by drawing the land use maps of all 64 municipalities. And then we put it in one image, and we looked at it, and we said to ourselves, are we doing this on purpose? <laughs> Does that really work? And, and if you think about the way the build-out would occur, you're in trouble. The maps that Bart referred to that we drew in alternative scenarios put the same kind of imagery in front of the citizens. And they said, don't do that. Do this instead. And that's the kind of metric we're starting to introduce in our conversations. It goes to your question, too, in Amherst, in, in the specifically. But the idea of, so do one. How about Hamburg? How about pick a, pick a community and really demonstrate how this plays back against all the metric forces? And I think we're very much in that, in that vein. But it's like, so you're going to pick a winner and everybody else loses? Or you, can you do it everywhere? Well, our sense is you could. So it's a distributed system. So if you've got a place you want to go to work, let's do it. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me. I, we heard from you. Let's yeah, pick him up. Sorry. We'll come back. Thank you. Uh, this is kind of similar. Um, work lived in the Allentown region and trying to get involved with the new Allentown reconstruction project, street remodeling. <clears throat> and uh, what I, in the meetings, what we've been finding is that all of the uh, business owners don't want any change. They want it completely uh, restructured the same, same way. They don't want to get rid of parking. They want to keep all of the cars on the road. They're afraid of losing all of that because they're afraid of losing all the customers. So going back to you know an area where we can show a change in such a vital area of our you know city, what, what can we do to change these people's minds? What can we do? Because now the project is pushed off another year because um, there's been so much backlash, what can we do to change people's perceptions? How can we present this information and show them the change? The two of you need to talk, but actually three of you need to talk, but municipality by municipality, you have power. And the issue is to enforce that power. So in Buffalo, there's a new green code. The green code would make parking way less a requirement in terms of you've got to and way more something that the market could drive. You still got to persuade. Mm -hmm. But at least the government's not working against you anymore. <laughs> and, and the folks you've got to get to are the banks and the marketing construction. Jerry here is really interested in how we finance capital improvements. He served for years on the advisory group uh, committee for the city in terms of its capital planning and things of that sort. And somehow trying to sort that out. Jerry, do you want to get in on that with me? How, you, how, how is CNU positioning to make the kind of arguments against the kind of development pressures he's describing? It, it, it's probably the toughest issue out there for the Elmwood Village and for Allentown. How, how do you sort out the balance between parking and the walkable neighborhood? Uh, and we really haven't figured it out yet. Uh, and, and I know... 
part of the reason the green code keeps getting delayed and delayed and delayed is that they're wrestling with issues exactly like that. And, and, and we had the new development, uh, the benchmark development on Elmwood, which is going to take a, is taking a lot of parking away. And yet, uh, in the adjacent affluent neighborhoods to the Elmwood Village, you have a lot of cars. And, uh, and uh, so the parking is, is the biggest challenge, really, of, of all. I, I, there's no simple answer other than some more aggressive public policy to create parking behind stores or... In, Pardon me? You take over. <laughs> Sorry, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that we're not only thinking, what are we going to do with the cars? How about leaving the cars at home? Walking more if you live close to Elmwood Avenue, or for those coming outside from outside the neighborhoods to patronize those restaurants and businesses, give them a public transportation option such as a streetcar or even if it's on rubber tires, something like that, going up and down Elmwood and Allen every 10 minutes that you could jump on and off at will. Not, you know, not a standard bus every 20 minutes or less frequently, but something you could actually use. Then people wouldn't drive in from elsewhere, and we'd all be healthier. Thank you. I think the mic here and the guy with the hand up. Let me just offer something while he runs up there. In 1992, I was invited to the Buffalo Place Board to talk about, wouldn't it be nice if we had higher density living downtown? The board had their conversation. They listened politely to what the professor said. And then they said, you're out of your freaking mind. Don't you understand, going back to market, that I can make more money parking cars than building residences in downtown? Two years later, well, first of all, I went home with my tail between my legs and gone, oh, my goodness, how, the, how could I miss that? I did the math, and they were right. I did the math, and they were right. So I came back the next year, and I said, how about we talk about how to change the math? Because the math is wrong. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's empirically exactly the way it is, but we could fix this because there's not a great city in the world that doesn't take care of residents living in it. So let's be a better city. Oh, how do you do that? So we wrote a book on the new residential neighborhood for downtown, published in 93. They still weren't there. I don't know. That's not The market's wrong. Are you, it costs too much to build relative to the return in rents. What am I going to do? The next year, we had a summit and a whole 300 stakeholders from all across the region about downtown. The number one priority was residential living downtown. <laughs> Top, high, big emphasis. And I swear we changed the market by educating ourselves about why we wanted to. And we're now seeing incrementally more and more and more residential living downtown. I think every city needs to have that conversation, just that aggressively. And a contested idea, and the market's not right, will shift. And if we're doing anything in the community planning school, it's that. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Larry, and uh, I think that's a great point. Where there's obviously more demand for, and people are returning, uh, from, even from the suburbs, to live in the city. I though I think there's still though tremendous growth going the opposite direction still, and I think we have a problem within the city, where we're still incentivizing even within the city for those folks to live out there through our roadways. Uh, we have these major arterials that are basically p flyover zones for people in those outlying areas to get quickly into the city for their commutes. If those didn't exist, they wouldn't be living out there. That would be a really simple issue. And in fact, our maintenance priorities are misplaced in the city. If you've noticed, the driest, most passable st streets are the Skajakwita, the <laughs> the Kensington the 190, the interstates, and the worst streets are our own main thoroughfares. There's not enough room to pass given the snow and the like. So the, even the snow removal process has not really served those who live in the city 
well. It's served better those who live outside of the city. So something has to be changed in our priorities in terms of roadways, maintenance, and, and that whole business because we're just further enabling that, sp that sprawl to occur. To reconnect back to the original question, which was about economics, and I think that's a really big issue, and the cities also suffer because of this, there's a great PBS documentary. It's been airing for the last year or so about pruitt Igo uh, public housing in Chicago, I believe. And the, um, St. Louis. St. Louis, excuse me. And the, uh, it's an amazing documentary, and it shows that basically there seems to be better money for capital improvements and huge capital spending for wherever, whether it be a city, but particularly in the outliers where there's new turf, you know, to be, to be developed. And there's a scarcity of money for supporting maintenance and repair. And that economic uh, uh, imbalance is driving development in undeveloped areas, including the city. And that development isn't is always right-sized, whether it's a suburban style in an urban setting or we're now getting high density in existing suburban settings. It's, it's, the city is very goofed up in using very conflicting messages. But I guess what I'm driving at is I would like to see an economic presence here in this whole process to change how we're going to restructure the economic system locally to de-incentize these wrong-headed developments and to re-incentize the right things and to re-incentize maintenance, that we don't develop anything that doesn't have a maintenance plan behind it or funding for it because we just get into more expensive uh, pro costs down the road. So bottom line, it's a fool's errand to commit capital without maintenance. And second, Absolutely. Uh, secondly, going on from that, you need to give the mic back to him because we're going to have to wrap this up. Yes, and I'll plug uh, <laughs> your, your, on, on Monday, this gentleman, our Dean Shibley, is, is I believe, are you uh, hosting or are you presenting? Uh, uh, we're going to moderate a panel on the Sajakwood Expressway yeah. as an example of what Thank you're you. talking about. The goal there is to make things as uncomfortable as possible for those commuters, right? <laughs> uh, make them give up their car. Colleagues, we're running out of time, and I want to make sure we give full hearing to the, some of the expertise we have in front here. The, uh, I'm curious about if anybody has an energy question that they want to offer or a water question question that they might want to offer in the context of this work. Good. I'll save the microphone. Good morning. One of the things I'm interested in knowing... We, we actually need the mic because we're actually filming this and we want to make you a star. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Good morning. One of the things I'm interested in finding out, amongst other things, because of the many groups that I actually represent, is where is energy actually going with regard to the region for the next 20, 30 years? Um, alternative uses, of course, has been a big thing for the last 70 years. However, it has only been within the last six, seven years there seems to be this new impetus of actually trying to put that in place and how do we actually engage in the increase of alternate energy as a matter of being a community? I'm going to give that to Nick Rachevik. That's a, that's a great question. I mean, uh, this region's really been known uh, throughout history as being a place of innovation around the energy economy with the, the building of the power plants at Niagara Falls pretty early on and being one of the first electrically lit cities. I think the, the neat thing that's going on right now is there's a, a series of dialogues about how we're going to reform the energy vision and how, uh, how, the, how our electrical system is going to look in the near future. So the different utilities and also the Public Service Commission and the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority are having a series of statewide meetings to talk about um, having smaller power plants like uh, solar plants or wind plants within neighborhoods, uh, how those things actually start to work uh, in terms of interacting with the grid but also how it moves away from maybe this centralized utility model. And so I think uh, your question is it's anybody's guess, but to make that um, our visions for the future be more democratic, really people need to participate in those processes. So 
I would say if you're you know interested in energy as a topic, uh, Push Buffalo, Sierra Club, a lot of organizations are trying to get folks to to talk to those issues, um, but also look for the meetings that'll be held uh, in the region in the near future. Thank you, Nick. I think we're going to come back around on that as well. There's several other things to say about this. It's a really important subject. I want to sort of, in the same way that there's an energy economy, we've talked about the market economy, there's a water economy. There's an attitude that water is the new gold nationally, <laughs> if not globally. Um, how does that play out with the, the, the Buffalo Niagara Riverkeeper and the way you're now framing actions around water in our region? Well, we're trying to work on looking at the value of water resources and what that draws as far as various aspects of the economy. So in one area, it's how do we attract young professionals back to the region? Well, they want that live, work, play environment, and that means cleaner waters, um, public beaches in the cities, other things that can draw people here and want to be on our waterfront. Um, from the other aspect, we're also looking at how we can clean our waters from our land use perspective of, of how are our business using waters for, um, for their infrastructure or their um, manufacturing processes and what does that mean as output into our waterways itself and our fishing resources and things like that. So we're trying to t make a connection between the value of our water and its cleanliness back to its economic drivers. So what are our societal benefits that come from that, the cultural benefits, um, basically getting back to that triple bottom line event uh, uh, effect and essentially how we create healthier populations through, through the cleaning of our waters and the protection of our water resources. Thank you. Let me just take another level of this and then we're going to break for lunch. We've got both a, a session that will focus on urban design this afternoon and also our role collectively, everyone here's role, in planning processes that affect all of the questions and discussions we've already had. So we'll come back around to that. But I want to I give uh, David Hahn Baker a chance to speak to another kind of dynamic. We spoke about the alignment of one region forward, problematic though it may be, with the uh, regional economic development strategy across five counties, not just two, and also ultimately the so-called Buffalo Billion Exchange. Governor gives you a billion, we leverage it at least five times, and off you go. That construction and a number of other things that have been happening as we watch kind of contested issues turn to action, particularly in Buffalo and Niagara Falls, but more broadly, I think, across our region. We see some indication that Buffalo's coming back. And there's a, an almost a call and response that says, yeah, but not for everybody. And David, how do we even think about that? Um, I think a lot of it comes down to the issue of change. Um, the dynamic in society of, you know, I want to keep things the way they are now. Um, and, you know, um, I want to change the way things are now. And unfortunately, for those who want to keep things the way they are now, it's going to change. And I would say in my lifetime, what really amazes me is how much change there's been, how drastic the change has been so quickly. That for me, from a racial standpoint, when I was born in 1959, there were Woolworths my mother couldn't take me into. And then when I graduated from college in 1981, society had changed, the structure had changed. If, if I had the scratch and could own a Wool I could have owned a Woolworths. And 10 years later, when I did get married, and my father-in-law, actually, if I convinced him to do it, probably, probably could have owned a Woolworths if I wanted to do that. And that you could have that drastic change in 30 years' time is amazing. When you look at issues um, like um, um, uh, marriage equity, I mean, the change that has happened, you know, over just so quickly, where what seemed to be possible, you know, before and what is now is so drastically different. I know for me, you know, I used to run a political action committee in D.C. I'm supposed to know about politics. If you had come to me in February of 1988 and you said, Dave, a year from now, you're going to have a black mayor, a black governor, and a black president, I wouldn't even laugh because it wouldn't have made any sense. But a year later, that was the reality. 
And, you know, the Byron Brown, okay, I had a black mirror already, could deal with that. Uh, the black president, Barack Obama, had not won um, in Iowa yet. So it was nice he was running, but wasn't a serious issue. The black governor was really the weird thing. You didn't even imagine. You know, Elias Pitts would have to get caught in some sexual scandal and get <laughs> kicked out of government and, and then have to have a black lieutenant governor who actually would raise, what, who? You know. So just change happens so quickly. I think right now, th for this effort too, uh, one dynamic I think would be good for folks to talk about get a handle on, are we talking about plan change or manage change? Um, we're not going to plan change. I'm sorry. You're not going to succeed if that's your goal. Uh, the world just changes so quickly and so rapidly in our time frame. Uh, the idea that you're going to plan it and what you're going to say now is going to actually be reality a year from now or 10 years from now or 50 years from now, that's not going to happen. It's really more managed change. How are we going to manage change um, is really the question that confronts us. And you know, I think that our whole effort is talking about how we deal with change, how we manage change, is going to be a useful conversation uh, for us to have. Uh, for me, I look at the contrast between different systems and how they deal with change. Um, if you were in Canada and the province was the sovereign, it can look at the municip municipalities and say, I think you ought to get together, coordinate, get rid of redundancies. And you have two years to do that. And if you don't get it done in two years by agreement, I'm going to come in and help you. And then within that framework, the individual municipalities figure it out, and then they come up with something like the greater Toronto area. In our home rule system, that ain't how it works. They're, the state is not the sovereign. The individual municipalities are the sovereign. How do you manage change within the context of that system? And that, I think, is one of the things that really confronts us and how we deal with it. Um, so... You know, it's 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 a very interesting time. I mean, you know, beware of interesting times. But uh, that's what we've got. And how we go about managing change. I think that the work that UB is doing, that Bob has led, and all these things are really great because we have an unprecedented ability to uh, deal with data, manipulate data, and understand what's going on and communicate with each other about them than we ever had before. For me, as an environmental justice activist, a big part of was it a study called Toxic Waste and Race in the U.S. that came out in the mid-80s, where they finally had the data to look at um, where were waste sites located. And we had the zip codes, and you could tell where they were located. Then they had census data, which had race, income, and all that stuff, and they ground them all together in ways they couldn't do before. And they came out and said, what's the best predictor that you live in the same zip code as a hazardous waste site? And the best predictor by far was race. Income was also a good predictor, but race was even a better predictor than income or whether you lived in the same zip code at Hazardous Wayside. And when we began to understand, you know, that documentation or those facts, then that led to really empower the movement to, again, talk about um, is this right and man should change. I was, um, in 1990, the environmental justice movement sent letters to the environmental groups and said, uh, if you look at your boards, there are few people of color on your boards. Um, the Natural Resources and Defense Council asked me to join the board. And, you know, affirmative action, I like affirmative action. That's a cool thing. But I joined the board and went to my first board meeting and realized that, that isn't, if that's your goal for me to bring cultural diversity, it's not going to happen. Because the real issue here is of your 44 board members, you have more men named John than you have women on your board. If you can have, you can't even bring diversity for people from the same culture, <laughs> but of a different gender, the idea that I'm going to actually come and bring this culture change is not going to happen. Um, for me, it became an issue of how do I manage, you know, that change, um, because it created a real problem for me. Uh, I'm of the belief that if I, as a man, just gave something to women, that really isn't change. They really have to kick the door down. So it wasn't appropriate for me to be a leader of that particular effort. Uh, fortunately, a couple of things happened. One, there were women who really wanted to get in. Um, and the other thing was that the white guys in charge actually made a mercenary decision. We're going to really increase our fundraising, the way our money gathering. The way to do one way to do that is to plan giving. We're going to give uh, people to give money when wills. Actually, women last longer than men, so, <laughs> so a bunch of women are going to be making the decisions. And if we're going to get them to leave will to us, they need to have a sense that they're going to in charge. So what happened was in the 12 years I've been on the board, we went from less than 10% women on the board 
to about 35%. Um, so that women kicking down the door, that white guys in charge, you know, making the decisions that they had to make a change, and me just being a good vote, you know, on those things was a way to manage that. So to the extent that you can do analysis of all this stuff and figure out how do you manage change, I think are going to be some of the answers. But it's very interesting times. But, you know, I'm quite hopeful about it. Thank you very much. Beautiful. <laughs> so plan change, manage change. Um, this afternoon, we're going to hear a presentation from a planner from Buff State who's going to walk you through how we plan in this region. And the distinction between plan change and manage change might be a point of some contention, but worth talking about. The thought I want you to leave this morning with as we go to lunch, and I think there's a food truck. Is a food truck here? Is there a food truck? Are you shaking your head? Yes or no? There is a food truck. OK. There, there, was, there might be a food truck out back. Plus, there's snacks and other things. And I've, I've put us between you and lunch probably long enough. But I want to leave one, one last thought. How you organize to know determines what you can know. We are organized in our market, in our transportation, in our settlement patterns across the spectrum to know a certain kind of way. And every one of the panelists represents an opportunity to think differently, going back to how we do the behavior change that was initially introduced by, by Bart and by, uh, by Jess. So let's just try this for a minute. Imagine we thought differently, and energy was the new metric. And the energy economy actually was one of the things that shifted the way we thought about how we delivered all of the things that we routinely do in land use planning, transportation planning, settlement planning, uh, uh, green infrastructure, farms, uh, natural areas planning in the address to climate change. And if you did that, you'd get a different understanding of how to behave. <laughs> what if we looked at our anchor institutions, places like the University at Buffalo that aren't going to North Carolina anytime soon? <laughs> We're here. We're here on purpose. We like being here. And we pump about a billion and a half dollars a year into this economy. What if we thought differently about how that happens and what effect that might have on the plan change versus managed change that David was describing? And not just you be as an anchor institution. Kaleida Health is bigger than we are. And you go on and on relative to the folks who are going to be here no matter what. But an anchor institution way of understanding our economy is different than the energy way of understanding. And both of them together give us a completely different new way to think about the market dynamics we might aspire to and how best to deliver them in service of a sustainable one region forward. And we go to the water economy. It's a whole new conception of thinking. I mean, most of us don't quite know what it means yet. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a tough challenge. But if we really understood the value of the Great Lakes and the watersheds related to it, and began in a regional basis. And here, what region? <laughs> There's a big basin region here with a huge percentage of population and industry. As, how about that for an example of doing it right for a change? Again, thinking about it differently promotes different behavior and different outcomes. Different metrics come into play. And then finally, we have the whole aspiration for one region forward. Accepting for a moment home rule as the current law of the land and imagining that out of exercising that with real information thought about differently, we gave ourselves a way to get to a point where some of these things maybe shouldn't be in the hands of individual municipalities, and some of them should. But we'll do it to ourselves. Nobody's ever going to do it to us. And that's the theory. We can do this to ourselves in a way that we'll be delighted, <laughs> or somebody can drop a hammer on us, and we'll, we'll deal with the contest forever, which is frankly where we've been for a very long time. 
I think there's lots more questions. A, lot, a large way to get at it is both the explication this afternoon of the planning process we're trying to intervene in and in what kind of urban design. Sean Burkholder's here and he'll speak to us a little bit about urban design in this context. And what can it even possibly mean, given the individual authorities and responsibilities in development?